Director for Forensic Services at Evidox Corporation. Uh, prior, and Evidox uh, works in, uh, specializes in electronic discovery, electronic evidence collection and preservation, computer forensics, and litigation technology consulting are some of the things that they do. Prior to going to Evidox, uh, he was with the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office as the Director of, computer, of the Computer Forensics Lab, Director of the Computer Forensics Lab there, and he was with them for five years, uh, leading that lab up. And prior to that, he has over 25 years of experience uh, working in this field with uh, the police, uh, with local police departments. So please, uh, let me introduce David Puppetier. I'm going to slaughter your name. Yeah, that's all right. Thanks. You should wait to clap till it's done. It may not be that good. <laughs> Um, again, my name is Dave Papageras. I've, I've been actually uh, adjunct here for maybe four years, five years, doing uh, the digital forensics program. Uh, and as she said, I have, I've been doing digital forensics since 1998. Um, after 25 years on a police department and doing forensics, I did go and build a lab at the Attorney General's office, and now I'm on the civil side of it. So there's a lot of people here. What do you think of when we think of digital forensics? What do you think? I'm sorry? Identity theft. Identity theft. Okay, good. Anyone else? You're all here just because you don't have to go to another class, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> all right. so b back in 1998, we used to think of, we used to call it computer forensics back then, but we've changed the name to digital forensics because there's so much more. But back then, you used to think of digital forensics and it involved identity theft, check fraud. Today, and we're going to show through examples, digital evidence is involved in every type of crime out there and every civil case out there. Okay, so the field has grown dramatically in the last 10 years <coughs> because everything is digital. Okay, so here I'm going to talk a little bit about what digital evidence is, how we capture it, different things we can do with digital evidence that you may not know about, and then some of the things that we do in the courses here. I know in the introduction course here, when we do the introduction to digital forensics, we try to give you a bunch of free tools so you can actually start doing it at home and practicing and recovering data and recovering stuff using the tools. And it goes through, I think, four or five programs before you, you finish. The last one is usually the one I'm teaching now is called the Capstone Program. And in that class, you start by review, and then you go right into where you actually have seized a piece of evidence. You have to do the proper imaging that we're going to talk about here today. And then you have to recover the evidence. You have to type up an analysis report. And then if we have time, which we try to do, we actually have a mock trial where you have to get on the stand and testify as to your findings. So we walk you through the whole process. So when you go out. Now, some of the students who have taken this program and have graduated and moved on, I keep in touch with them. And they're in the field. They're actually working in the field, which is a great thing to show that Going through the program, some of our students are able to go out into the field and get into, the, into their career in that. So we'll get started. Any questions, just shoot them out. Look how times have changed with digital, with, with technology, okay? 38 years for 50 million people to use a radio back when the radio first came out. 13 years for the TV. Four years for 50 million people to start using the internet. Technology is going, people are using the technology. This is a great one. Nine months for 100 million users to register for Facebook. We're what, 1.1 billion right now, right? If you ever commute, I, I usually take the train into Boston, what do you think I see people doing all day on the train? Yeah, right, Facebook. They're on the Facebook, right? I actually believe that it's an addiction now. I don't think it's just a hobby. I think people are addicted to it and that pretty soon there'll be a therapist out there to help people <laughs> with that. But that's, again, everything I say here is my opinion, right? <laughs> this, is my de this is my disclaimer. Okay. What, when you see this, what do you think about? What do you think? Look at it. Old. Old, I like that, old. But it looks like a computer, right? I mean, a monitor, keyboard, and a mouse. Now, I know I'm probably one of the older ones in here. But when do you think this came out? 1980s. 1980s is a good guess, right? I was thinking like late 80s. I was thinking more like 86 maybe, 87, 88. Does that sound? 
for those that were born and up, right? right? Would this surprise you? 1973, they were using this in a think tank out of Palo Alto, California. My point to this is, if this was around in 1973, what do you think they're playing with right now out there for technology? We don't know, but it's amazing to think that they were using something we didn't get for what, 10 or 12 years later out there? Okay, so here's some quick stats I put together. Okay, mobile devices, seven billion. Estimated to pass 7.5 billion devices by 2016. When we talk about mobile devices, most people today, I don't know how many people that use a flip phone anymore, but what do we usually see? iPhone, galaxies, right? So basic phones out there, the Android operating system and the iOS systems. What is an iPhone when you think about it, or an Android? Yeah, it's a computer with a telephone. And now we're getting, what the, what's the iPhone, 64 gigabytes of storage? It's a lot of data. So everyone walking around with a smartphone, what do they technically have? Digital data with them on everything they do, everywhere they walk, all right? So we're gonna talk about that. All right, so here's some case examples. One of the things I always like to talk and teach my students and I, when I teach police officers and teach across the country, I always like to use case examples to bring it in, okay? When we think about, I said earlier, there's digital evidence in every, every crime out there. It's there, mostly today. All right, we have to think outside the box of where it is and how it can be recovered. Now, one of the things those students that have, have had me before, they know that I'll start going down a road and I might veer off and go somewhere else, but I'll always come back to where I started, so I'm gonna veer. When you think about digital forensics for a career, there's always three main reasons that digital forensics would have to be done. Criminal cases, civil cases, and administrative hearings, okay? So when I talk about digital evidence and recovering, you could be working for a prosecutor side, the prosecuting side, the government, or you could be working for the defense, because everyone deserves to have a defense, right? And your job as a digital forensic examiner, if you go down that road, is we have to have the highest ethical standard, we have to maintain a neutrality, we cannot think about if a person is innocent or guilty until we are done with our examination and we can prove how the evidence got there and if it's there, who put it there. So I use an example like this. Keeping an open mind, an office building. They have a network printer, which means, as you know, you can just print and it will go over to a network printer. So in this one company, all of a sudden the printer turns on, 13 images of child pornography print out. They look at it, they trace it back to an office with one person in the office with a laptop. They call us. We do a background check on the guy. He is a level three sex offender who failed to register from the state of Arizona. And he's in Massachusetts. Child pornography points, prints on the printer, comes back to a single office, one laptop, one man in the office, level three sex offender, failed to register. We arrest him for failing to register. We seize the laptop. We do a forensic examination. What do you think? Guilty or innocent? Guilty. Everyone says he's guilty, right? Huh? Innocent. Who said innocent? There you go. He was innocent. It was a virus that loaded onto the computer and printed those images. Again, so just by telling that story, we already we predetermined in our mind, but as an examiner, we have to keep an open mind until the facts come in. So when I say there's digital evidence in every case that can help either the prosecutor or the defense, these are some case examples. May have nothing to do with the crime, but the other thing you want to prove when we look at digital forensics, whether it's a mobile phone or a computer, it gives us the mindset of that person. I could do a forensic exam on your computers and I'd be able to write a synopsis about your life and about what you, you do. How long did it take for you guys to prove his innocence? Um, I would say that the exam probably took three to four weeks. Yeah. Wouldn't he still get charged for not registering? He did, right. But he did not 
get charged with the child, the possession. Wouldn't the virus have to come somewhere? Like possibly from a website he visited with those That's a great question. Uh, that computer, when I did that computer, it was probably one of the cleanest computers I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, no pornography whatsoever. How many people know this guy? My students can't put their hands up. <laughs> right, Dennis Radner, right? Serial killer, 35 years or so, was killing people. He used to tour with the police. He would drive down the street and he'd take Polaroid pictures of the people he had killed the night before and stick them on stop signs. He'd walk through the Home Depot parking lot and he would throw the photographs in the back of pickup trucks of those victims that he had killed. And he used to write letters to the police and say, you're never gonna catch me, I'm smarter than you, right? And apparently he was doing okay because for 35 years they didn't catch him. And what comes along? Technology. So he sends a letter and he says, if I type you a letter in Microsoft Word and put it on a floppy disk and send it to you, will you be able to catch me? What do you think the police said? No, we're not that smart. What he didn't realize is a thing called metadata. Anytime you use Microsoft Office, there's metadata. It's hidden data within the document. Okay, and it lists the name of the person who registered the software and the name of the company that owns that software. So when they got that, the forensic examiner looked at the metadata. It had the name Dennis Radner and the name of the church that he worked at. They started following him and doing research and eventually they got enough probable cause where they made the arrest. Okay, so again, had nothing to do with all those killings, but it helps in solving that crime. Here's an example to show you about metadata. Okay, I typed this document on a Microsoft Word product. I saved it. After I had saved it, I went in and I put the parentheses around the name Word and resaved it. And then I copied out the metadata. And here's the metadata. It tells me when the document was created, when it was modified, the name of the person that authored it, and how many times it was edited. Okay? That's a lot of information hidden inside a Microsoft Word document or an Office document. In his case, he didn't know about it. And it led into him. And then police investigations went the, went the further way. As they started following him, they got enough evidence to where they could charge him. So metadata. Here is a real case I did a long time ago. When you look at a computer, there are two things that you have to remember. There's allocated space and there's unallocated space. And the way to remember it is allocated space is when you turn a computer on and you're looking at the screen, what you see, that's all allocated, you can see it. Unallocated space, you can't see. But using forensics tools, we're able to get into unallocated space and recover data that's in there. So in this case, this individual typed a Microsoft Word document on the computer, on his laptop. He typed it, never saved it, typed it, sent it to a printer, mailed the letter in to the work was, this is a restraining order violation, to where his ex-girlfriend worked. We got enough probable cause, we did the exam on the computer, and we were able to recover that letter out of unallocated clusters. And you can see at the top, that's where it's telling us it was recovered from, unallocated areas. So allocated, you can see it. Anybody can see it. You turn the computer on, what you're seeing, it's been allocated space, it's live. Unallocated, it gets dumped. What he didn't realize is what happens when you're typing in the Microsoft Word document, what happens in the background? It auto-saves every, what, 10 minutes, I believe, right? And it creates what's called a temp file. When you close out of Microsoft Word and you save it or you don't save it, once you close out of it, that temp file gets dumped and it goes into unallocated clusters. So just because he was typing on that letter on that computer, he didn't save it, he printed it, we were able to recover it out of the unallocated areas. Things that people don't realize, that tracks that are being left behind. And one of the questions I get a lot of times is, although we see it, we don't see a lot of it, is overwriting of files. You delete a file in the overwriting. And why, why do you think today we don't see overwriting of files as much on computer systems? I'm sorry? Well, it's not memory, but you're on the right track. Bigger hard drives, right? In the old days, we had a 20 megabyte hard drive. It was crunching and crunching and crunching, okay? And today, we have, what, 500 gigabyte drives coming standard in computer systems. That's a lot of open space for the, the data to be sitting. How about this guy? What do you think about this guy when you see him? First thing to come to your mind. 
scary. All right, needs a shave. All right, this is Mucka McDermott. He walked into Edgewater Technologies back in, I believe it was 2000, the day after Christmas, and killed seven people. Laid the rifle down on the floor, got arrested. What do you think he claimed when he went to court? Insanity defense, that he was crazy when he did it. Okay, when the troopers did the forensic examination on his computer, this is what they found, a web page that he had been searching days before the murder. How do you think that looks to a jury? That he's searching for how to fake mental illness. And this was only one of the pages they were able to recover. Right? Did the, the, the digital forensic examination of that computer have anything to do with the murders? No. But it shows the mindset and what he was looking at prior to the murders. So it helps to show to the jury what his mindset was. A normal person doesn't look on how to fake mental illness before a murder that he's claiming mental illness on. I like this one the best. Another serial killer, he felt he wasn't getting the attention he deserved by the police. So he printed out a map, made a circle and X on it, and sent it to the police. They went to where the X was, they dug up the ground, there was a dead body there. So then they started researching it. What he didn't realize is, I believe he used Expedia to do this search for this address. The police served Microsoft with a warrant to find out who was searching for this address in the last 30 days using Expedia. How many people do you think were searching for that address in the last 30 days? One. Him. Okay, so again, by look, looking outside the box, they get a map from the internet with an X on it, they go and there's a body there, a little research, search warrant, who's searching for that address, leads them back to their suspect. Again, the digital evidence and the, inve and the internet investigation brings it around. Okay, so again, these are just some civil cases. A lot of times in civil cases, and I'll talk about it for a minute here, digital forensics and e-discovery are very similar. They go down the same road to a certain degree, okay? And with the identification, the preserving, and the collecting. But a lot of times with e-discovery, unless there's a, a question of spoilation or deletion, you may not do a forensics collection. You may just go in and do what's called a live collection. You might just go in and collect all the documents or all the email. You're not worrying about unallocated clusters. So it's case specific. Okay, so here's civil cases. Again, digital forensics, spoilation, right? So the, the, you can see when there's spoilation, there has to be a digital forensic exam done to show that those files were deleted. So again, we've seen criminal case examples and there's civil case examples. Okay, how many people have heard of EXIF? Yeah, of course, John. I, at least you learned something. <laughs> all right, so we talked about metadata, right? And we all know now that metadata is where? Office documents. Excess, excess information is the same in a way to metadata, but it's in digital photography, digital photos, okay? Excess and geotagging. So here's an example. We look at this picture, and we see that it's a house, right? Just a white house sitting there. Here's the EXIF information that was obtained from that picture. Again, embedded in the picture that we're able to extract out. Now this is going back to 2006. I can tell the make and model of the camera. I can tell when the picture was taken. But it's only as good as the date and time the camera set at. So you can't really go by that because this is telling me it was taken at 10 o'clock at night. But I know it was taken during the daytime. So it's only as good as the date and time that's set on the camera. Go ahead, like the question? Yes. Um, when the companies design these programs and they have that version of like backup of sorts, um, what do they have in mind when they do that? I don't know. Because does it, it can't just happen. It's like they design it for that. So uh, why? Why? Do they do it specific? If there's a crime, they can find who I don't, I don't think they've done it for law enforcement, trust me. Um, they, they, don't, they don't go like that. Uh, the only, you know, and I'm only talking outside my head right now off the top of my head when I think about why would they do that. Um, remember Apple a couple years ago got in trouble because everyone's iPhone, they were capturing where they were sending and doing stuff. You know, again, 
Uh, is that good for advertising? I don't know, maybe, you know. Um, the other thing is when they thought about the future of being able to take a picture and uploading it immediately to the, to the web, maybe they wanted to um, show where it actually came from, so they incorporated that into it. Uh, but I can't really say why they did it. I know it does help law enforcement um, sometimes. So. Um, so a case down and around this area, as many years ago I did, an individual who was taking uh, pictures of his students that he trained to ride horses, and he would uh, abused them, and he was taking pictures of them naked, and I was able to get the EXIF information off that, and when we searched his house with the search warrant, I was able to match up the photos with the camera that was in his possession through the EXIF information. Okay. So this was back in 2006. Now, going forward, this article in the Wide magazine is a little scary. You hear it a Flickr, right, and Photo Bucket, all those sites that you can load up stuff. Well, this, this, uh, this uh, author was sitting in a park, I believe it was the Golden Gate Park, out in California once, and he saw someone taking pictures with the cell phone, and so when he went home, he went on Flickr. And Flickr has an option of having a map. You can look at the map, and it has a purple dot where everyone is uploading photos for that time. And he sees the dot over the Golden Gate Bridge area at the park. He clicks on it, starts doing a little digging, and all of a sudden, it's the girl that was taking the pictures, and now he sees all her personal photos inside her house and outside her house. So you gotta be careful with geotagging. And I believe if I don't have a slide in a few, I'll tell you how you can kind of shut that off on your phone. So again, just by being in an area, seeing people taking pictures, not realizing what's being uploaded uh, with those pictures. So XF and geotagging. Now we come. I'm sorry? No. If you have an iPhone and you have um, location services turned on and it's turned on with the photo and you take a photo and you send that photo up. Now, uh, if you post it to Facebook, Facebook a lot of times will strip the EXIF when they post it up there, but other sites like Photo Bucket doesn't. So if you were to post a photo up there on Photo Bucket um, and you, someone downloaded that and used an EXIF reader, they would get the information out of it. So now we're covering it now, right? Last, one I, last example I took was 2006. This one I took recently. I show this picture all over the country. And if my students saw it, they can't answer this. But where is this? Who can tell me where this is by looking at it? Any ideas? School playground is good. Come on, you guys, aren't you some criminal justice majors here? What can you tell me? It's fall, great, good. That, no, that's, that's important, right? Because we know it's not Arizona, right? I mean, so we can, we can look at this and, and we know it's either a park, right? A school, right? Uh, northeast, somewhere in the northeast of the country, right? So, but other than that, we can't tell too much, right? EXIF information, look at all the EXIF today. All this is inside that picture. iPhone 4, all the settings. Look at that. GPS location. Now, what can I do with that? Well, put it into Google Earth. Right where I was standing when I took that picture. How can that assist in investigations? Huge, right? Mm -hmm. Something that people don't know about. How many knew about that before you came here today? Yeah, let's put it down. <laughs> I, I'm done. I, I just have to give you one tip. <laughs> okay? Pretty powerful, right? You're still saying, I don't know where it is still, no, but if you were on Google Earth, you'd just bring it out a little more and you would find out the area it was in. Okay? To show how accurate it was, you just saw where I was standing when I took that first picture. I just took another picture at the entrance to the field. Look at where it has me standing now. Okay, first picture down here, second picture up there. And that's within maybe 10 minutes as long as it took me to walk around that park to take a picture on my way out. So the, the location is pretty accurate on those photos and what we can get off those those images, okay? Sorry, where is that? Uh, see up by the four? 
at the top. Oh, okay, yeah, the little square. Yeah, that's where I was standing. Why can't we just use this all the time for everything? Then? Why is anything ever lost? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why? Yeah, like sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, why? Why do I have to hold my records for seven years and the IRS can't hold them for a year? <laughs> uh, stuff gets, stuff does get destroyed. Um, stuff does get wiped. Uh, if data is wiped on a computer, uh, we, we can't recover that. And I'll, and I'll talk about that right now. Um, you know, because I get that question a lot of times. Hey, if I wipe, you know, like if, if you're familiar with um, uh, in the computer programs or uh, in criminal justice, you might hear something called the DOD 7 wipe. You know, the DOD, they wipe digital data seven times. Um, can we recover that data? And the way to look at it is just sitting in this area right now, if this was a hard drive, you guys are all allocated. You're allocated. That's just like a computer system. It's all allocated. The seats between you was unallocated. There could be data there from the person that sat here in the last class. Forensically, we we're able to see that. So if I was to format this room, it would just move everything and put it up into those last few rows. And usually with the forensics, we can recover the formatted drive back again. But if you wipe a system, and you have to wipe it seven times. If you wipe it once, what's going to happen is it's going to start in this chair. It's going to put a zero, 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 zero. So what's just happened to the data that's sitting there? It's gone. What's there now? Zero. zero. What am I going to recover? Nothing. Nothing. OK? So for most people, when it's wiped once, forensically, we don't, we don't get it back. Because that data has been absolutely wiped out and another character put in this place. Can you tell if it's been wiped? Sure, just by looking at it. Very unusual to have a 500 gigabyte hard drive and, and have a certain pattern of characters you know, throughout the whole portion of a drive. Any questions on EXIF? Oh. Now, a person, if you couldn't just go into like, your options and point your hard drive, right? You would need to no, you need to download a program. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and you bring up another great point, though, is, and I've said this for years, and it's a joke in law enforcement, is that we don't catch the, we, we don't catch the smart ones, right? We, we don't. But what's out there today that wasn't out there even seven years ago? When you buy um, a, a computer now with, with Windows 7 or Windows 8, you have Windows 7 Ultimate, what comes with that? John? Oh, come on. BitLocker, right? BitLocker comes, encryption. They're giving you encryption to encrypt your computer, right? So if a computer has encryption running on it, and we go to look at that computer, and that computer is shut down, if we don't have the key, we're not getting in. That's how strong the encryption is. If the computer is running when we get there, we're going to image it live. We're going to image it live, and then we have a copy of the system because it's opened up. Why don't people use BitLocker? Or why don't people use TrueCrypt? Any ideas? I'm sorry? No, because we're lazy. It takes time. Yeah, we're lazy. It's time, right? I mean, it's another step that you have to kind of go through to look at what you want to look at. And so people, we just don't do it. So the new iPhones with the fingerprint lock, have you ever had to get into one of those? Uh, I usually just cut their finger off. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, no, I've not. I've not had to come across that yet. Uh, and usually, and, I'm, and, and uh, I, I'll research this, but usually there's a back door in, like meaning, you know what I'm saying, if your finger doesn't work, you can still use your passcode. Um, we've come a long way with mobile phones. Um, first version iPhones, we were able to get by the passcodes, um, but later versions were not there yet. Um, so, okay. So, digital forensics, it's a controlled process. Right, that's a big, big set paragraph up there. The main thing I try to get across to my students when I teach is it's the controlled process. It has to be controlled on how we actually do the image and how we do the examination. And it has to be repeatable. That's why they call it a science. Right? It has to be repeatable. We use certain procedures. We use certain policies and, and stuff when we do the exam. Okay? So some people say it's a science and some say it's an art. And this has been known for years, people would talk about digital forensics. It's forensics, it's a science, and it's an art. It's a science because some procedures are repeatable, meaning if I image a dive correctly and one of my students does it correctly, we're gonna have the same information because we're gonna do it the same way. 
Now, I used to believe this in the art. Not to, no two examinations are the same. Every examination is different. But two examiners should get the same data. And I use this example is that if I am doing an exam on a computer system and it's been imaged properly and everything matches up and you are an examiner and you get this drive and you're doing an exam, should we find the same information? Because it's, it's right? So for example, if I found 3,000 images of, um, I'm not going to say, uh, profanity, okay, should you find 3,000 images? They're there, correct? So that's where the art comes in. But now what has happened is, now we have all types of experts out there. And I did a case where I had to look at a computer for images of, of illegal material. And I found them. And that gave us a warrant, probable cause to get a warrant and seize a computer. Many years later, it's in court for a motion. They hired another, they hired an expert, defense expert in digital forensics. And they said that I lied on my affidavit, that there was no illicit images on that computer that I said there was to get the warrant to get in the house and get all the evidence. So they wanted everything tossed, right? Fruits of a poisonous tree for those criminal justice people. It's probably a test question someday. Um, so I had to go in for a hearing in front of a judge. And the expert was there. It was actually through a phone call to me. And they said, well, where's these images that you found? And I said, they were Thumbs databases. Did he look in the Thumbs database files? And it was quiet on the other end. The other expert didn't know what a thumbs database file was. So again, the, the, the talk of that two examiners should find the same, I had a caveat now that's depending on their experience level. Right? Somebody with one year experience may not actually know enough about everything that someone that's been doing it for 15 years is going to know. So the art part of it is still there that we should find the same stuff, but you have to remember about experience level. Myths, we just talked about this, we can recover everything, we can't. It's quick and easy? No. Um, you know, a, a digital forensic examination could take weeks depending on the amount of media you have going through, how many, you know, what you're looking for, is it being carved or not. Um, data will never change during an exam. That's true once the image is created, but in today's environment, we may end up changing data. And the golden rule is we never want to change the data. Right? So we can't be blamed for doing something, but I just mentioned it earlier, and that is that with BitLocker and encryption, we may have to image that computer when it's running. So we're going to take a thumb drive, we're going to plug it into that computer. What did we just do? Yeah, we just changed data. We just made an entry into that system. Okay? If we want to image the RAM, because that's where everyone's passwords are stored, and we plug that in and we execute a program that's going to go up and load in the RAM, we're taking away a little of that data, we're changing data, but we have to document it. In today's environment, we have to keep up with technology. 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, they didn't have BitLock or any of those types of encryption. They may have TrueCrypt or one of the others. But in today's environment, with all the encryption, we may have to image the RAM of computers before we even image them so that we get the passwords out of them. So we are changing data. And the golden rule is we have to document everything we do so that we're in front of it. Yeah, I plugged the thumb drive in. I had to because he had encryption running and I needed to get the passwords and, and the, the, the little bit that I changed was worth what I gained. So we have to document it. Yeah, let's just someone keep track of the time. I have a tendency to ramble. All right, we already talked about this. So I'm going to fly through it. I talked about how we allocate and unallocated clusters in Slack space. So here's an example of Slack space. A, a, cl a certain cluster on a computer has so much space in it, say, um, it's going to take up that whole cluster. And you should already know that from your network classes. But the space that's left over is going to be slack. So a great example I use is think of a VCR tape. I know we don't have VCR tapes anymore, but it's a good, it's a good example, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's easier to explain. <laughs> A VCR tape is a one-hour tape. You recorded a one-hour show on Monday. Tuesday night, you watched the one-hour show. You rewound your tape. Wednesday, you recorded a 30-minute show. What's still on the VCR tape? 30 minutes of the show from the day before. That's slack space. Same thing in computers. If you load a document, it only takes up half that cluster. Nothing else is going in that cluster. 
you deleted the Word document and reloaded another program that took up some of that cluster, the Word document is probably sitting in that Slack space, and you're able to kind of be able to recover that. Okay, basic things that we kind of do with digital forensics. We always create a duplicate of the media. We never work on the original. All right, we have to verify that what we've imaged is correct. We always want to, which I, on the civil side, we do all the time um, because we have more resources, but we put the images on a hard drive that we've created and then we make another copy for a backup. So we have two of everything. Law enforcement, a lot of times we'll just do it onto a server because of resources and money. We can't afford to always do two drives. Once the image is done, the original goes into an evidence room or gets put away, it never gets touched again. You're always working off those images. So you're never touching the original piece of evidence after you've done what you had to do to get the image. No matter if it's a computer, a thumb drive, CD, I'm trying to think of other types of digital media, but I'm drawing a blank right now. We do the same process. We're going to image it using write blockers, which I'm going to show you in a minute, so we don't write anything to that data. All right, we, we verify it, we check it, we do everything the same, but there's one other step we do if it's a computer. One other step we have to do. And that's we have to check the BIOS. We have to check the date and time that that computer is set to. Because what if I got a computer that was from California and I start looking at the forensics image on my machine that's set to Eastern Standard Time? It can be off by three hours, right? So we have to confirm that and check the date. So when you're doing your investigation, the date and times of those files, you want to make sure matches <coughs> to what you're actually doing. So with everything going on with virtual drives, <coughs> do you guys cooperate with companies that have virtual drives? Have you ever had to, have you ever had to investigate uh, a virtual drive? Like, virtual like drive? you mean like cloud storage? Yeah, yeah like, like, uh, like Google Drive. Yep. Yeah. So, so cloud storage is a great question. Cloud storage brings up a whole new arena with forensics because if we had to go in and get your, I'm going to use you because you asked the question, if we have to go in and get your Google Drive, are we going to be allowed to image the whole Google server? No. So we're not going to be able to do a physical. We're only going to be doing what's called a logical. So we're just going to go in and we're going to grab your folder, logically create a forensics image of it, and that's it. What do we lose by doing that? Anybody? What do we lose if we only do logical and not physical? I'm sorry? No. Um, that would be my question in my next classes, since nobody's answering it. You don't get unallocated clusters. You don't get deleted data. Because you're not getting physical, you're only getting logical. So with cloud storage, that's something that we just get in front of and we say, that's all we can do. Google's not going to allow us to you know, image a 14 terabyte server, right? So we go in and we get your 500 gig, but it's only 500 gig alive. So solid state hard drives. I'll talk about that in a minute, um, which brings up a new issue. Write blockers, we use write blockers. We hook up the original media to a write blocker so that we're not changing any data as we're conducting that image. There's, there's hardware and there's software write blockers. These are what they look like. They just, the, your, 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 I don't want to say suspect, but your target drive will get hooked up to the outside, gets plugged in, and it gets imaged. So it's like a one-way street. Nothing can go back to it. And in the intro class here, we actually validate our write blockers. And how do you think we validate a write blocker? Well, we do in my class. How do we, how do we validate a write blocker? Yeah, we hook, we hook a drive up to it and we try to put a folder on it. It's going to come back and say, you can't do it. It's write protected. Now we know our machine is working properly. We, I validate my machines, every, my write blockers every six months is usually the standard that we do. Solid state hard drives, newest thing, right, came out a few years ago. Everyone thought it was the greatest thing. Now they're actually going backwards and they're saying, well, solid state, if you, if you don't know what solid state drives, there's no spinning platters inside. How many put your laptops on your lap? What happens to it? It's Very hot, right? With a solid state hard drive, there's no spinning platter, so it stays cool. And it's faster. It's all chips. It's just going back and forth. But there's a problem. It's called wear leveling. It wears the, wears the drive out. So what they've done now is Apple has a new drive. Um, the name of it's eluding me, but they have new drives now coming, hybrid, hybrid drives coming out. You have solid state and you have spinning platters. So your OS may be on the spinning platter and other things go on the solid state because they find that they're not going, staying as long. 
But here's an example of what we have with solid state hard drives because of where leveling is. When you delete a file in a platter drive, it goes into unallocated space. And we're usually able to recover that. Solid state hard drives, there's no spinning platters, it's all circuitry, and there's a thing called wear leveling that moves data around constantly so it's not wearing down that chip. So when you delete a file, there's a process inside solid state drives called garbage collection. And it starts going and it gets rid of deleted files. Now, when we take a solid uh, state hard drive out and hook it up to a write blocker, and we start imaging that drive, the garbage collection could start running on that drive because it's on the controller of the drive. And each drive is manufactured separately to know when that garbage collection is to run. So as we're imaging it, we could, the deleted files could be getting lost, but there's no way around that. It's like imaging RAM. I can image RAM of your computer right now, 10 minutes later go back and image it again, and the hash value is not gonna match because it's changing. So we just have to get what we can with solid state. So I was doing this for another presentation. I created a folder on my desktop, and I deleted it. You can tell by the red X or the red circle up there with the red box with the box around it. On the, and I deleted it, and I took a screenshot to show what a deleted folder looks like, looking at it with an end case. So you can see all the allocated stuff. There's all the folders there, but the one with the red circle, that's telling me that's a deleted folder. You wouldn't see that if you logged onto the computer. But forensically, I can see it. So I did this. I shut down my end case, because I took the screenshot I wanted to. And I said, oh, you know, I want to do one more thing. I want to do one more thing for another screenshot. So I brought my drive back in to my forensics program. Two minutes later, where's the folder? It's gone. So of course, I'm sitting there thinking, then I remembered, I have a solid state hard drive on my OS. Two minutes, it was gone, non-recoverable. So again, solid state with garbage collection, it can, it, data can be gone and we may not recover it. The same with apples. Apple OS is very good at cleaning up itself. When people delete files on an OS, a Mac OS, the, the cleanup is really good. And a lot of times we may not be able to recover everything. So let's talk a little bit about mobile devices. Mobile devices, mobile forensics, is similar to, to computer forensics because what is it, what's it, what is um, the Android operating system, the iOS operating system, the Windows 8 operating system, what is the Mac, what is it all when it comes down to its barest level, what is it at the smallest level? I'm sorry? Binary. Binary, very good. It's all zeros and ones, right? So mobile forensics and computer forensics, it's all dealing with ones and zeros. But the way we do mobile forensics, each phone can be different. We might be able to get everything off of one phone, and we're only able to get a call log off another phone. Okay. Now, with everyone going to smartphones, how many smartphones in the room? OK, I was going to say, who has a flip phone, right? <laughs> Atta boy. Good job, right? <laughs> so with, with flip phones and the old phones, we, 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 we might get one off one thing and one off another thing. We weren't able to get, you know, it was all on the technology and what was in them. With the smartphones today, we're, we're pretty much able to get quite a bit. We're not at the point now where we can get Outlook email off an iPhone that's being synced because the technology is not there. But if you logged into your Gmail account, we can get that, okay? And so there's, there's quite a bit we can get. But each phone can be different. And here they are, smartphones, you know, um, the, the, the different brands of them. The, the major ones that we're seeing today are right up there, the Galaxies, right, the Android, the, the iOSs. Uh, very, we see a lot of the Blackberries because of the, the corporate still uses them a lot. Tablets, right? iPads, we're able to get stuff off the iPads and the tablets the same way as if there was just an iPhone, um, the way we're able to get stuff off them. Okay, um, some of the old, the SIM cards maintain certain equipment, I mean certain data. So mobile devices, things that we have to consider is where's the device synced to? That is huge. If you have your iPhone, and, and hopefully it's the next slide so I'm not jumping too far ahead of myself. If you have an iPhone, what's one of the things you want to do with it right away? Music, it's don't say music, right? And how do you put your music on there? Through iTunes, right? And so you plug it into that computer. What happens when you plug it into the computer? It syncs, but what does it do before it syncs? 
backs up. Every time you plug your iPhone into your computer, it does a backup. And it puts it into an encrypted folder on the Windows operating system or the Mac OS every time you plug it in. It doesn't overwrite the folder, it just keeps creating them. Every time you back plug that phone in, it creates a snapshot of everything that's on that phone. Okay? It can be backed up to the iCloud, right? So if you set up to go to the iCloud, every time you plug it in, it's just backing up to the iCloud. But if you do it, I think, and I'm not sure if it's default is the computer, but if you plug it in and don't have it going to the iCloud, it is creating a backup on that computer you've plugged it into. Yep. Even when it wasn't connected to the computer, and it would, that eats up so much data. Right. So. It would still sync up to the iCloud without being into the computer. You're right. Yeah. But there's an option in iTunes to allow it to go to the cloud as well. So, so we look for, when, when I'm doing a case now civilly, um, if I look and there's a mobile sync backup folder, I look right there because that's telling me if it's there and the data's in there, I have a copy of that person's phone when they plugged it into that computer, even though I don't have their phone. Okay. And I think I, here it is right here. This is on the Windows machine. You can see the mobile sync backup, and there's one, two, three, four. It just keeps going every time the device was plugged in. You can see the FOE, the FOE. If the numbers are the same, that's the same device, just plugged in two different times. Okay? So the first couple of the 377 might be my iPhone. Uh, the ACD may have been one of my iPads. The third one may have been my other iPad. But if the numbers match, those GUID matches, those are individual machines. Then we're able to take these backups, and you can see them over to the right. They're encrypted, so you just can't look at them. But using special software that we have, we're able to bring it out. And this is everything that came out of that encrypted file. It's like I had the phone on the day it was plugged in. All their voicemails I have. I have all their chats. I have all their texts. I have all their emails. Just like I had the phone that day. So when we're doing forensics on cases, just because we have the laptop, we might have a lot more because if they plug that phone in, we have a copy of their phone. Everybody they called. Voice notes. The actual voicemails. We're able to listen to the voicemails. Okay. <clears throat> we can extract all this mobile phone stuff out as a PDF, XLS, doc. I always do them with HTMLs. When you do it HTML, it all hyperlinks up. You want to listen to the voicemail, you just click on the link. That plays it. Okay, so again, things to look outside the box. Where's the evidence? Where am I going to find it? And how is it going to help? One of the things that, because I know I'm running out of time. Okay. So, different tools that we use for doing forensics on phones. Celebrate, Lantern, Celdec, Paraben, Encase, and Sistine. I'll tell you right now, they call Celebrate the Cadillac. Okay? Because Celebrate, when you went into a, uh, a mobile phone store to buy a new phone, and you bought that new phone, and before we were syncing to the cloud, you know, and they pushed everything to the cloud to back up your phone, um, you'd buy your new phone, and they'd take your old phone, they'd go in the back room, and you see them hook it up to a machine, it would suck all your contacts and everything off and your pictures, put it on the new phone, they'd unhook it and they'd give it to you. That was a Celebrite. Celebrite was in every mobile phone store just about in the country. So what did they get? None, none of the, they didn't have to reverse engineer every new phone that came out because the companies were giving them the code because it was in their stores. So Celebrite said, you know what? We're pushing from one phone to another phone. What if we push from one phone to a computer and we sold it to the law enforcement for $11,000 a piece? we'd have a forensics unit, and so that's what we have. So Celebrite has the codes, so they're always getting the codes for new phones. And uh, it, it's a great tool, and it's out there, but there are many tools for doing mobile phones forensics. Lantern, this is the one I use for the mobile phone uh, sync backups. The encrypted folders, you can see, I can just point it right to a file or folder, and it will decipher and it will break apart all that stuff and put it out into a report for me. So again, just different tools that we have to use in order to get the data. There's the cell bright. Right? Nice, small, compact, does the job. Hook it up to the left. The newest versions now, it, was, it, it will come up and it will tell you what phone you plugged in. And it automatically adjusts itself to extract what it can. 
With the newest iPhones, we're only able to get what's called the file system extraction. Physical is the best. iPhones 4 and below, we're able to get some physicals. But most phones, file system, and advanced logical is all we can get uh, right now, which, which gives us quite a bit. So you're saying that anybody could get one of these and just get anybody's password for anything, and that's why? If you have $11,000 you want to spend, they'll sell it one. <laughs> That if they, well, what would they need, though, in order to do it? They need your phone. You need to have your phone, right? Yeah. So if they had your phone, yes, you could hook it up. They could hook it up, and they could get in. But we're not able to break passcodes yet on many versions of the iPhone. We're only on the first versions of the iPhones we're able to break the passcodes. OK, Faraday bags and a Faraday box. When we, when we take a cell phone out in the field, what do you think we have to do to it? We have to disable it from talking to the network. Because what do we have on phones today that we didn't have even five years ago? Sorry? GPS. Well, GPS, yeah. But if I was, um, if I was law enforcement, I seized a bad guy's phone, um, what could he do to it today? He could wipe it. He could do a remote wipe, right? You can go on, find my iPhone, find my iPad, whatever, and send a wipe command, and it wipes out the phone. It's gone. Right, um, so once we get them, we put them in this device here, and it blocks the signal. So nothing is going to hit that phone, and it saves it for us to be doing the extraction. So, how am I on time? You got about five minutes. Five minutes, okay. GPSs. The thing to remember is, when I say iPod, what do you think? What is it? Music, Music right? As a digital forensic exam, we have to get out of that mode. Anything that can store digital data can store any type of digital data. Can I put Word documents on an iPod? Yes. Sure. Can I put child pornography on an iPod? Yes. Absolutely. Anything that can store digital data can store any type of digital data. Xbox 360s, PlayStation 3s can store any type of data on them. That's why when we seize digital data, we seize everything. GPSs. We're able to now extract data out of GPSs, bring it into a KLML file into Google Earth, and show everywhere that vehicle went. Okay? Now, in the old days, this is what we were able to get off a of GPS. All the, all the coordinates. Because what is a GPS is doing in the car? When you have your GPS in the car and it's just on, what's it doing? Give you directions or something. It's, it's communicating, correct? As you're driving, it's constantly communicating. Why? Because if you're like me and you get lost, you just have to push a button and say, where am I? And all of a sudden it tells me where I am. How does it know that? Because it's communicating. All this stuff isn't programmed in. This is stuff we're able to extract just because it's there being stored by the device. Now today, this is what we get. This was taken out of a GPS. You can see the purple line. What do you think jurors think about this stuff? What do most people watch on TV and believe is totally 100% real? <laughs> CSI. Pretty cool though, right? Shows exactly where the vehicle was driving. Okay. This case here this individual robbed about five to seven banks in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. When they did the GPS examination off the GPS, we were able to show the route to every bank on a drive-by the day before it was robbed, and the same vehicle going there the day as it was robbed. Why do you think this is the last one we got? He was arrested. Where was he arrested? I believe up by his car that was parked right there. The bank is back here, was on the corner. Again, extracted data from the GPS. It can help. OK? So I'm probably up on time now, right? OK. So a couple minutes of your questions. Well, excellent. I, oh. I'd like you to kind of just talk a little bit about your educational background. How do you get to be in your position? And what kinds of things should they be thinking about? OK. Well, I'm a little unique. I, I'm a little unique. Um, I didn't go to college until I was 38 years old. I was self-taught. I, um, 
I was self-taught because I had an interest in computers, and I liked taking them apart and fiddling with them. And then when the internet started coming out and I started playing with that in 1998, I was a detective, and I started doing internet and computer crimes. And since then, I've been to numerous schools across the country. I had a very forward-thinking police chief who was uh, very, very supportive of me learning this field. And in uh, 2003, I became a member of the United States Secret Service uh, Electronic Crimes Task Force. They sent me all over the country to schools. Um, since then, I've been to numerous schools. I've got a certificate degree from Marshall University, and I hold uh, six different certifications in the field of digital forensics. Uh, back when I was doing it, there were no college co programs out there. I think the first one out there was the University of New Haven ran a program um, back in the early 2000s, and that was it. Where today, we're seeing it everywhere. Um, in the field today, you know, it's a little different. When I started in 98, there was, uh, there was mostly law enforcement guys that were doing it and kind of progressed up, but today, it's the opposite. We're seeing more corporate, we're seeing more civil. Um, so, again, I was kind of self-taught, but I've gone through the educational since then. And a lot of computer, though. A lot of computer background. Um, or not so much. A lot of computer pro um, background as far as blowing up computers and trying to fix them and, <laughs> you know, learning them and stuff, yeah. Yep. But today, you know, I, I get this asked all the time with my students, and it's like today you have to have training. You have to have the degree. You have to have a certificate. You have to have something to get started. And even here, we talk about it. We, we're hoping to get a certification program in line here as well so that they can move on to that.